Because I love talking about this receptor so much, the PPAR gamma receptor, let's bring in this particular condition called lichen planta pilaris. Because over here, prostaglandins play a crucial role in stimulating the PPAR gamma receptor. But also, this might tell us a different sort of angle where having too much PGE2 could potentially harm this, you know, delicate balance of having PGD2 and PGE2 or PGF2 as well. The condition known as lichen planta pilaris comprises a family of cicatricial lymphatic alopecias. Essentially, these are scarring alopecias that are due to some sort of dysfunction caused by the PPAR gamma receptor that elicits an autoimmune response that causes your lymphocytes and other white blood cells to attack and destroy the hair follicle organ, destroying important structures like the sebaceous glands, as well as the very important stem cell bulge. Now, if you don't have this stem cell bulge, then the hair follicle can't grow because these stem cells exist in that structure and it regulates the antigen cycle of the hair follicle, the growth cycle of the hair follicle. So if PPAR gamma receptors are downregulated, this leads to various dysfunctions that causes this sort of horrible hair loss condition that leads to permanent hair loss. Because it's in this dysfunctional environment, a condition known as lipotoxicity occurs, which means there's too much lipids and your body wants to destroy the things that are kind of creating these lipids, being these sebaceous glands and the cells that are inside them called sebocytes. But it causes for that sort of inflamed environment, uh, you know, hyperinflamed environment that destroys so much of those hair follicles. And you can learn more by reading the paper titled, quote, PPAR gamma agonist and their role in primary cicatricial alopecia, unquote, by Sararin Horang Chuang and Poonkind Shachuanit. So you're probably wondering why are prostaglandins important here? Well, remember that prostaglandins themselves are lipids and the PPAR gamma receptor responds to ligands or lipids. And these ligands activate the receptor to turn on certain genes that are important for metabolizing lipids and essentially filtering out the environment and keeping a sort of homeostasis so there aren't too many lipids or too few lipids, which could disrupt the environment and can prevent cells from proliferating, you know, duplicating, right? And differentiating, becoming, you know, different cells. This is very crucial for hair growth. So to reiterate here, you need a balance between PGE2, PGF2, and even PGD2, because some prostaglandins can interact with the PPAR gamma receptor indirectly or directly. PGE2, for instance, does not interact with PPAR gamma receptor. On the other hand, PGD2 is not an effective stimulator of this receptor. According to the research detailed in the paper titled, quote, novel prostaglandin D2 derived activators of peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma or PPAR gamma are formed in macrophage cell cultures, unquote, by Christopher K. Glass and colleagues. PGD2 itself acts as a poor ligand or a poor activator of the PPAR gamma receptor. To address this, researchers explored how PGD2 could be converted into its metabolites within macrophage cell cultures to better activate the PPAR gamma receptor. The study found some pretty interesting things. That during the metabolic process, PGD2 is transformed into several distinct metabolites, and some of these metabolites demonstrate a significantly enhanced ability to activate the PPAR gamma receptor, such as 15-DPGJ2, <laughs> what are, you know, such a mouthful of a word, which is a very well-studied metabolite due to its role as a natural ligand for the PPAR gamma receptor. I think it's worth noting that PGD2 can turn into a PGF-alpha derivative metabolite known as 9-alpha-11-beta PGF2-alpha. That particular PGF-alpha sort of derivative can also bind to prostaglandin F2 receptors and serve as a natural PGF analog, which could, in theory, like bimatopros, latanopros, and travopros, stimulate hair growth. But I guess it depends where this is occurring, right? If it's occurring in the dermal papilla cells, then, yeah, it'll kind of stimulate hair growth there. If it's not and it's occurring in macrophages, it can activate different genes in there too. And to be fair, this is a study about macrophages. But I'm going to assume that 
you know, maybe it could extend itself to other parts of the hair follicle environment. And if not, it's a sort of immunomodulatory kind of ligand. But with that rambling out of the way, isn't it weird, right? Because we like to think that PGE2 production, as well as PGF2 alpha, is good because it decreases PGD2, whether directly or indirectly. And PGE2 and PGF2 seem to help hair grow, right? As we know from the PGF analogs, Latanoprost, Bimatoprost, and Travaprost. But in theory, if there are a considerable decline in PGD2 and its metabolites, and those metabolites are known to directly stimulate the PPAR gamma receptor, this could cause a downregulation of the PPAR gamma receptor and lead to a more lipotoxic environment, as other lipids may not be as good of sort of stimulants to the PPAR gamma receptor, and then they might begin to accumulate, and that leads to lipotoxicity. It leads to the lymphocytic infiltrate that ultimately destroys the cells that are producing the bad sebum, right? The bad lipids, as well as the malformed PPAR gamma receptors. So balancing PGD2 and PGE2 levels through targeted therapies could therefore offer new strategies for managing hair loss conditions by manipulating key prostaglandin pathways. But that's enough rambling about prostaglandins. We can clearly see how important they are when it comes to hair growth. But the main takeaway here is that generally speaking, PGE2 and PGF natural or synthetic analogs seem to stimulate hair growth from hair follicles. Hey guys, I just want to jump in here real quick because I didn't include this in the previous clip, especially in the bigger video that it came from. So we're going to be talking about potential side effects here. So prostaglandin F2 alpha analogs have been documented to cause localized fat loss, particularly in the context of its use around the eye area in products such as, you know, eyelash growth serums like Latisse, uh, maybe Bermatoprost, and they also mirror as glaucoma medications like Latisse, Bermatoprost, and Travaprost. And this effect is known as the prostaglandin-associated periorbitopathy, which can result in the thinning of the skin, hollowing of the eye area, and a decrease in periorbital fat. So, Primarily, this seems to be due to the impact of prostaglandin F2-alpha on adipocyte biology, specifically its role in reducing adipogenesis, and this is the creation of fat cells, and also potentially affecting other cellular processes such as the proliferation of those cells. Now, this process is noted in the study titled, quote, Effects of prostaglandin F2-alpha on adipocyte biology relevant to Graves' orbitopathy, unquote. And this is by Draman et al., and it was published in 2013. And we have another study over here, which is also relevant, which is titled, quote, Do prostaglandin analog lash lengtheners cause eyelid fat and volume loss, unquote, by Jamison et al. And, and again, when we kind of bring this to the context of the scalp, I guess it's theoretically possible that PG2 alpha and maybe PGE2 could influence scalp tissue, similarly to how we, you know, see the reduction in fat loss around the eye area. But it's also important to recognize that this hasn't been noted significantly in the literature, right? So it could be due to a lack of research specifically targeting this question, whether prostaglandin analogs like PG2 alpha analogs or PGE2 uh, PGE2 analogs could cause a sort of similar fat loss in the scalp. Maybe there isn't enough research, or potentially it could be due to different physiological conditions, and you know, particularly relevant to the a sort of condition of the scalp. Right, there probably is a lot of subcutaneous fat in the scalp to the point where using a prostaglandin analog probably wouldn't cause that much fat loss because there's just so much to compensate for. But maybe at the same time, you know, how many people are actually using that in studies, right? How many clinical trials were done in the course of the previous decades using prostaglandin analogs to kind of grow hair on the scalp? Maybe not a lot, right? And maybe we're not using it at a high enough concentration for it to be a problem in the scalp. 
At the same time, though, that doesn't mean that the risk doesn't exist, that the typical concentrations that these prostaglandin analogs are typically used for the eyelashes and the, you know, the eyebrows. Maybe, who knows, that doesn't cause an issue with scalp fat or subcutaneous fat in the scalp at those particular concentrations. But maybe if we go to a higher concentration, let's say 1% latanoprost or 1% bromatoprost or 1% travoprost, just as a sort of arbitrary marker, maybe that point is where we start seeing issues with subcutaneous fat loss in the scalp. So that's something you want to keep in mind. I guess I'll put it this way, right? Just to make it simpler to understand, because I'm partially rambling here, because it's a bit ad hoc. But unless you're going to a ridiculously high concentration of a prostaglandin and you're using it on your scalp, you should be all right, right? If you're using it at its typical doses that we use for the eyelashes and the eyebrows, that should be fine. However, there is another sort of risk to possibly keep in mind with long-term use of topical prostaglandin analogs. And this would probably be due to its potential cardiac events. So this study was published to the Review of Optometry and it was published actually quite recently, uh, January 17th, 2025. And at the time of recording this video, it's February 21st, 2025. So let's read the title. The title is, quote, Hypersensitivity, Cardiac Events, and Most Common Systemic Adverse Events from Prostaglandin Analogs, unquote. And it notes that these were predominantly reported among female and elderly patients. So that's something to keep in mind. However, it notes prostaglandins like latanoprost, bimatoprost, travoprost causing systemic issues related to cardiac events, right? You have events involving tachycardia, right? Uh, angina and other sort of issues regarding, you know, heart pain. So, you know, it could be a, a sort of correlation thing here because as you, you know, the older you become, the more common those sort of cardiac issues, you know, reveal themselves, right? The more, the more frequent they become in that sort of population of elderly patients, because, you know, as you get older, not to be morbid, but your body kind of breaks down, especially in the cardiovascular department. So that could be a sort of correlation there, but it seems as if, and I'm not going to go through the whole paper, but this paper seems to be portraying that, yeah, most of these cardiac events seem to be strongly correlated to the use of these sort of topical prostaglandin analogs, right? And that potentially, maybe in those studies where they see that the population that is using the prostaglandin analogs has a higher incidence of these sort of cardiovascular issues compared to the population that isn't using those uh, prostaglandin analogs, right? So maybe elderly patients that aren't using PG2-alpha or PGE2 um you know, prostaglandins, they don't seem to have as many cardiovascular issues such as the population that uses PG2 alpha analogs or PGE2 analogs. Because they also note here that prostaglandin F2 alpha acts as a vasoconstrictor, right? And again, that could potentially explain why it's increasing blood pressure and it's causing some of these patients to have cardiovascular issues. So as... <laughs> Maybe you don't use the prostaglandin analogs long-term, right? Maybe use it and cycle it every now and again. That could be a potential way of mitigating these issues, but nevertheless, those issues still are apparent. So hopefully that all made sense, and I wasn't just rambling. But in any case, I'll leave the sources to that in the description below. See ya.